Let's pick up from where we were last time. Should we do a quick recap of a few pertinent points? We were discussing Abraham and Sarah. We spoke about Abraham. What did Abraham introduce? He wasn't the first monotheist. We were many before him. He was not the first one to believe in one God. What was he all about? We said he was the first one to preach monotheism, do something about it. We made a comparison between Avram, Abraham, and Noah. Noah had a similar mission. He, to some degree, failed in that mission until Abraham picked up. Noah was still a great person, but he did not succeed in it. Abraham did. Abraham is called the Hebrew, ha-ivri. What does the word Hebrew refer to, ha-ivri? What do we say? Two possibilities. Ivri means, look at your notes. It's not cheating, it's not an exam, yeah? Right, well, that's Pesach, right? But you're right. He passed over. What does that mean, though? He was on one side, and everyone else was on the other side of the world. Is that a geographical statement? Well, a little bit. He was on one side of the river, and they were on the other side of the river. But it was also a theological statement and a philosophical one. Everyone was following idol worship, and Abraham came against it. Right? Then we started to speak about Abraham and his, the way he influenced people. And all these are going to be very important to us as well today. How did he influence people? He would move. He would move around and he would go to cities and towns with his wife. He would set his tent. We said he lived in a tent. He didn't have to live in a tent. He could have afforded a house. But tents are immobile and he wanted to be a moving person because he wanted to move people. You get that? You see what I did there? You want to move people? Yeah, okay. So that was Abraham. Um, and the first test of Abraham, we're going to see a 10 tests. And the first one was Lech Lecha. What does Lech Lecha mean? To go. Lecha means two possibilities to you or for you, for your own benefit. Or to you. Something about yourself. So in other words, he shouldn't really have needed to move per se, but God said, this is going to be very, very good for you. Where was he told to go? Trick question. Morning. Where was he told to go? No, he wasn't told. He, very good. He wasn't told to go anywhere. Where was he going? Not Israel. Was it called back then? Canaan. Right. Canaan. It was called Canaan back then. It wasn't the land of Israel yet. It was still a very special place. Which Abraham entered. Good morning. Hello. It was still a very special place that he entered. Um, okay. That's pretty much where we got up to, in short. Let's begin. Page four. We're going to look at a Mishnah from Pirkei Avot. A Mishnah. You ever know what a Mishnah is? What's a Mishnah? A Mishnah is, when the Torah was given, it was given in two forms, a written Torah, God bless you, and an oral Torah, an explanation. If you like the Torah, the five books of Moses that we have are like the headlines. I right? imagine you get a New York, New York Times, you cut it all out and you take headlines and stick it up somewhere, and then you have an explanation that goes with it. The oral Torah is the explanation, what we call Torah Shaba'al Peh. The Torah Shaba'al Peh, is the oral Torah that goes with it. Eventually, after many years, it had to be written down because it was being forgotten, the Jews were being exiled. This is a discussion we'll have later on, but just so you have it right now, okay? Um, the first part of the oral Torah is Mishnah, is Mishnah. Mishnah. And the Mishnah is discussed and described in the Gemara. The Gemara is an explanation of what's going on in the Mishnah. The Mishnah is usually very cryptic. And it covers all topics from Shabbat to holidays to Kashrut, you name it. It sacrifices, it's all in the Mishnah. Right? The bulk of Jewish law that you find, you have no idea what to do by looking at the Torah, by looking at the Bible. It's all the oral Torah. There's no explanations really in the Torah itself. We start to discuss Torah, we're not there, we'll discuss it in more detail. However, in this book called the Mishnah, the series of, 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 of books, we have a book called Pirkei Avot, or Pirkei Avos, Chapters of the Fathers. And these are six chapters, and in these six chapters are ideas and thoughts, philosophical ideas, um, which 
have within them certain ideas of uh, Jewish understanding, Jewish philosophy, but not really any Jewish law. Okay? So in Pirkei Avot, which you can hear, you'll hear a quote a lot, Pirkei Avot, now you know what it is. Six chapters, yeah. Five chapters of Mishnah, actually, and one chapter of Brisa, but that's um, the six chapters, yeah. That's a custom to learn on Shabbat afternoon. It's very just it's ideas of inspirational thoughts and ideas from the rabbis. Right? Okay. So, in chapter five of Pirkei Avot, Mishnah three, it says the following information. Asara nisyonot nidnaseh Abraham Avinu. Abraham was challenged with 10 tests. He was tested with 10 tests. Allah shalom. Va'amad and he really won all of them. Well, actually, amad means he stood, right? Amida, to stand. He stood by each and every one of them, right? He conquered them. He was able to overcome all of them. What is this? Lahodia. This information comes to teach us. Kama Khibasul Avramavino Alava Shalom. How great Abraham was. That he was able to overcome these ten tests. What were these ten tests? So they're all mentioned in the Torah. They're not listed in a list in the Torah, but they're mentioned in various stories of the Torah. There's actually different opinions as to what these ten tests are. We'll look at just one version of what the ten tests were um, in the Midrash at the bottom. Let's look at the Midrash. Now, what's Midrash? So Midrash, as we haven't mentioned in the last class, are like stories and ideas that are a slightly lower caliber than Mishnah. The Mishnah has more legal ramifications. Midrash is more stories and analogies and metaphors and explanations of stuff from Jewish history. So God is very pure. Abraham was tested with 10 trials. What were they? Number one, he was thrown into the furnace. Remember we spoke about that last class, if I remember? Who threw Abraham into a furnace? Maybe we didn't mention it last class. His name was Nimrod. Nimrod threw Abraham into a furnace because he wanted to kill him. Why? Because Abraham's father didn't like the fact that Abraham smashed all his idols, thought the kid was going bad, off the derrick, as it were. So he threw him, uh, and Nimrod said, take back your, your uh, belief in one God, worship idols. Abraham refused, he was thrown into a furnace. He was willing to throw himself into a furnace, and actually he survived miraculously. Two, God told him to go for himself. That's Lech Lecha, remember? Three and four were two tests concerning Sarah because she was kidnapped and was unable to have children. Five, he was told to take Hagar, his maidservant, as a wife. Six, he was told to remove Yishmael. Yishmael was Hagar's son through Abraham. And he was told to drive him away, he had to leave the home. He was a bad influence on Isaac. This was a test because Abraham did not really want him to leave. Seven, he had to go to war to save his nephew Lot. There was a battle that Abraham had to fight in. Seven, that's eight, he had to circumcise himself. Nine, there was a certain prophecy that he had called between the parts. And number 10, the biggest test was taking his son Isaac. That's on the next page. So let's think about this for a minute. The Mishnah tells us there are 10 tests, and then it lists these 10 tests. The most difficult of these 10 tests was number 10. How do we know? How do we know that number 10 was the most difficult of all 10? You should know this. It's all rhetorical, you can answer, don't be shy, yeah. They haven't warmed up yet. Well, it's because it's asking him to kill his own son, his only son. Okay. So, we'll talk about it itself. Yeah, but he also had to kick out his other son, and there are other tests as well. What is it about being the tenth test, the last test that we know makes it into the most difficult test? How do, no, basically, what I'm asking is, how do tests work? How do tests work? Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's no point to the rest, but number 10 comes after all the other nine. You're right about that. And that has significance. Did anyone see the Olympics recently? 
Rio Olympics, and I watch that. I don't see, um, suddenly start watching sports you're never really interested in, you know? Mm. I never watch weightlifting, all of a sudden I'm interested in weightlifting, it's weird, right? I'm not interested in that, you know? You feel this desire to start watching sports, you know, like high diving, like, I go and watch high diving or something. So, uh, if anyone sees the high jump, you know the high jump? I do it like, you know? You have a, like, a bar over here, yeah? And the person's gonna jump over the bar, okay? And they have, I don't know, 10 contestants, 15, whatever they are, guys who wanna, who wanna win this. So they start the bar very low, yeah? Start over here. And then, let's say, nine out of 10 people get over the bar. What do they do then? They raise it, yeah? It goes up to here. And then five of those people get over the bar. Then what do they do? So they raise it more. And they raise it up here. And at that point, only two people get over. And then what do they do? They raise it even higher, because, you know, and then only one person, that one person gets the gold medal. I would look at that and be like, that's so cruel. Why do they keep raising it? Obviously I don't like these people. Obviously being very mean to all these people, making it go higher and higher and higher. Why can't they just keep it low and let them all jump over the bar? Imagine you're one of the first people to get out. You're like, oh, I can now sit back, relax, no pressure, no stress. Ah, there's other guys, those suckers. There's other girls, they're gonna have to jump higher and higher and higher. Is that correct? Is that the right way to think? No. Why? Why is that not the right way to think? Because by the bar going up and up and up, what are you saying? You have potential for greater height. Right? Doesn't mean the people who couldn't get over the second bar are still very impressive. Right? Each time it goes up, it's something. But the fact that it's getting higher and higher means that you are, have great potential. And obviously the highest is the most difficult to get over. Right? The last one, because only one person gets it over. This is an analogy, a metaphor, a mashal for tests in general. And this is a key point, that life is a test. And we learn this from Abraham, quote unquote the first Jew. Abraham is not found, we'll see in a moment, you know, sitting in a lot, hanging around with his friends, you know, meditating all day, hugging trees. He may have done that, I don't know, but I don't really care. What I do know he was doing was he was being challenged. So one of the first things we see from the Torah is that great people are tested. Truth be told, we're all tested all the time. And sometimes we win, and sometimes we don't. But it goes up and up and up and up and up, and the greater a person becomes, the greater the test. Just like the greater the high jumper, the greater the bar, or the higher the bar goes. Yeah? So we looked at the first, well, the second test, according to this list, of Lech Lecha. First one was to move. But let's look at the last one. The last test, obviously, is the hardest one, because that shows he was number one, he gets number two, he gets number two, number three, number five, and eight, and then nine, and then finally, he gets to the most difficult test, why was it difficult? The tenth test of Abraham was to take his son, his only son, from his wife, Sarah, Isaac, take him up into a mountain, and to sacrifice him. Now that, from what we've just said, from the classes we've had already, does anyone have any problems with that test? Yeah, Gabby. Hello? Isn't that exactly what Abraham was told to tell everyone? What was Abraham's mission in life? We spoke about this. Don't worship idols. How did most people worship idols in those days? What was one of the main methods? They would kill their children. So one second. Abraham is being told to take his son, his only son, the one he wanted, the one he prayed for. Sarah and him struggled for years and years, then miraculously she gave birth. We'll see the whole story in a few moments. But miraculously she gave birth to this son. And then he sought to kill him. So number one, killing a child, obviously is abhorrent. Second of all, it's illogical. Because Abraham was told his entire life, don't kill your children. We don't kill our children. 
So what we call the Akeda, Akeda, the Akeda, Akeda Yitzchak, the sacrificing of the binding actually of Isaac. So number one, we don't kill children. That's not the Jewish way, and yet Aaron has been told to do it. Number two, it's his son, who he was told would start a new nation. So Abraham said, I'm going to leave your son, and through the son, all generations will come out, eventually us as well. But why am I kidding him? He wasn't married yet. He didn't have any kids. Number two, we don't kill children. And number three, most importantly, it's his, his love. He loved his son. He didn't want to kill his son. This is very, very problematic. These are very, very big questions. We have to answer them. So I'll just share with you a few different ideas over here, which we'll take with us, just to figure out this one particular test of Abraham. Number one, we're told the faith that Abraham had. Although it's illogical, it was illogical, he was still willing to do it. It was illogical, made no sense. And he had great faith in God. And he's complimented for that, right? He's greatly praised. He was willing to do it, and he went exactly as he was told. Did he kill his son? No, what happened? Anyone know the story? Right, he was stopped, told not to do it. Eventually there was a ram, and he took the ram, and he took a chauffeur. It was a shot, actually, coming up. And he cut the, 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 the ram's horn, and he brought the ram as a sacrifice. It's a whole story to do with that. Why is that important? Because that was a lesson for the rest of us, yeah? We watched this whole story of Abraham, and what do we learn from it? You don't do this. See, for Abraham, he had to go through this test and then had to be stopped. But what do we learn from it? The idea of faith in God, the idea that challenges come to us, which are sometimes illogical. But what are we also being told? That Abraham was a very famous person. This was done on, he wasn't told to go into his basement and do it. He was not to go into a mountain. What are mountains always represent in Torah thought? High places of learning, of teaching. Deserts represent challenge and difficulty. A mountain represents a information that's going to be shared. You go on a mountain to shout out, right? You go to a high place. Yeah. So he was told to go to a mountain and he tells the people, this we don't do. How do you teach people? You talk about it, you discuss it. There's another way to teach people. You show them. You say, this we don't do. You teach them through action. Now, Abraham knew, that, thought he would have to do it. But the fact he was stopped means it becomes a lesson for the rest of us on what we don't do. I heard another beautiful answer to this. I'll just mention it. It's not so much connected, but I'll mention it. It teaches us something else very, very important, ladies. You know what that is? Humility. Abraham is walking around his entire life. And he's saying, don't kill your children. Don't kill children for God. That's what we have to do. Don't do it. Don't do it. We mentioned already people are still doing it. People are still willing to kill their children for God for a higher cause. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And here he is, way into his hundreds, and he's walking around with his son Isaac. And someone says, hey, Abraham, where are you going? He goes, I'm going to that mountain. And he says, well, what are you going to do over there? He goes, I'm going to sacrifice my son Isaac. <laughs> what? You've been telling us for years and years not to kill our children. That's all you've been doing. What would he have to say? What would Abraham say? I was wrong. It's very humbling, right? I thought I had it all figured out. I had this whole life thing figured out. I thought I knew it all. And what did I learn? I was wrong. Imagine how difficult that was. It's probably the hardest part of the whole test. Thinking something your entire life, for your entire life and preaching it, and then being told, no, nah, that's a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. He was right. But he had to go through that test. So tests aren't always as clear and simple as they appear at first.
Abraham passed the test. He passed this. How do we look inside Bereshit? It says in Genesis chapter 26, verses 16 to 18, on page 5. By Yomi, he said, Be nishbati no Hashem. By myself, I swear the word of Hashem that because you've done this thing, you've not withheld your son, your only one, I will bless you. I'm going to surely bless you. Now look, it's a very important word. I'm going to surely bless you. When a word appears twice, same word appears twice back to back, it means very much so. It's a little um, code in the Torah. Look at page 5, note 3. Abraham is told, I'm going to bless you. It doesn't say bless you, it says, Barech Avarechah. It's the same word. Right? Just like Lech Lecha, Hebrew. That means I'm going to really bless you. It's like um, green in Hebrew is Yarok. Some of it refers to the Torah, it says Yarakrak, which means very green. Right? Adam is red. Adam Dam is very, very red. So Abraham was being told, because this, you are going to become the source of all blessings. God gave him the ability to give blessings. Now, before this point, God said, I'm the only one who has the ability to bless people. We have to find what that means, but I can bless people, give them wealth and success. He says, I'm not doing this, I'm going to give it to you. Now, humans have the ab ability to give blessing to others. Abraham was the first one. Ki barach barach ha harbe arbe. Zerach, I'll give you lots of descendants. There it is. Ve harba arbe, many, many. Et zerach ha kachof hashmaim, like the stars of the heavens. The coal and the sand, I see the, the stars in the heavens and like the sand. I shall sfateyam that are on the banks of the rivers of the sea, yeah. on the seashore. The yirash zarocha es sha'ar oivov, and your enemies will be conquered. And I'm going to bless through your sins. Call Gareth all the nations of the world. Because you listen to my voice. You know, there's, you may know there's many Christians out there who are very pro Israel. You've seen this, by the way, today. A number of, many of them are not. Historically, it's been trouble. But now, a lot of evangelicals. So there's a dispute whether, why, why are they so pro Jewish? Why are they so pro Israel? So one opinion is, well, you know because they want the Jews to move to Israel so that Jesus will come. You know, they're looking for our demise in some way. But many people say, no, they're very pro-Israel and pro the Jewish people, because it says, whoever you bless will be blessed. This is actually one of the reasons, one of the positive reasons. There's many, many good Christians out there, many of them, who are very pro-Israel, pro the Jewish people, because they see over here, I'll increase your offspring, and I will make the nation of the world bless themselves by your offspring. That means that the non-Jews will get blessing through you. That's what it says. So we better be good to the Jews, because through them come blessings to the world. Okay? So these 10 tests were made Abraham great. It wasn't his great wealth, which he had, but tests make a person great. Says the Nesiva Shalom, this is Rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Rizovsky, a more recent book, and he says, you know what? These tests of Abraham are important to us. Oh, well, let me give you an introduction to this actually. This is a very important idea. This is a very important expression you're going to hear. I give you Hebrew expressions, not because I want to torture you, but they have great significance. And it goes like this. There is an expression which is used among the rabbis, and it's called Masa Avot Siman Lebanim. Write it down. Ma'aseh siman l'banim. I shall translate those words for you. Ma'aseh, what's ma'aseh? La'asot, to do. to do, or the actions. The actions. The actions, avot, of the 
forefathers. Siman, what's a siman? On Rosh Hashanah we have simanim, signs. Lebanim, to their children. Very important expression. You can hear it again and again and again, and it's very, very relevant to our topic that we're covering today and God willing next class. Masab Asim Lebanim. The actions of the forefathers is a sign to their children. Says the Ramban, one of the great commentators, he says that this is very important. If you want to understand what's happening around you today to the Jewish people, right through history, look at the forefathers. They were like the embryo of the Jewish people. They started the whole thing going. If you understand what happened to them and their actions, that's a sign, a portent for the future. Now, there's different ways to understand. Some say this is like a mystical thing, you know. Well, they went through it, we're going to go through it as well. But some say, no, history repeats itself. The tests they had, we have. The challenges they have, what happened to them is a microcosm of what happens to us. It's a sign for the future. All the things that happened to them were coincidental. All the things that happened to them were a sign right to the end of days. And it's going to happen to the Jewish people as a nation, or even as individuals, is a sign for us. Let's have a look at an example of that. Abraham was tested with 10 trials. So too, he says, so too, says Ziva Shalom. Call Echad Be'echam Israel, so to every single Jew, Bid Naser, Be'amechayav, also has a Saran Israel, 10 tests that goes with them their entire life. There are 10 tests in every single person's life. Shekol Chayav Shel Ishiudi Rutsufim Nisernyot. For the life of every Jew is marked by ongoing challenges. And most, this doesn't mean that God hates us. Not like, oh, I'm going to this difficult, lost my keys, all these big challenges we have, or bigger challenges, right? He says, no, this shows how much Hashem loves us. When you're tested, it shows that you're loved, you're involved, that you, the God thinks very great, the bar is going higher and higher and higher. It <laughs> shows how great and beloved you are. Call you D. Every Jew, Mizera Avraham, is from the seed of Abraham, Avinu. Okay. And the central feature of a Jew is being descended from Abraham is that he trusts in God when he faces the test. Abraham was tested, we're tested. Abraham had great faith and grew in his faith with his tests. We do the same thing. I mean, it goes much deeper. The actual te- the way he was tested, all those things are relevant to us as well. That's not for now. Questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah. Actual, like, would, would some people say there's actually 10 challenges that a person goes through their lifetime? That seems what he'd be saying, yeah. So, do people track that? <laughs> like, do very religious rabbis kind of like. Are they able to analyze? see in their own lives, analyze? I don't know. I've never heard of a person doing that. <laughs> right. It's hard to know. And as a person changes, the tests change, right? It could be a person stays very low. They stay at the two meter mark, sorry, two foot mark, and maybe two foot one inch. And, Absolutely. Oh, 100% subjective. So, a test for one person, not a test for another person. For sure. Depends where they come from, what their inclinations are, who their parents are, the year they're born in, the decade they're born in, the century they're born in. Everyone's very, very different. One test for one person is not a test for another person. Absolutely. That's a very, very important point. Yeah, no, sure. Of course, but I'm saying, like, so is anything. Okay, never mind. Go on. Is anything more subjective than. People form over time, so I mean, today there could be a challenge for me that kind of God has. Do you know when people say that God has a plan for you? Yes. So today I could be very different than I am tomorrow. Yes. But if God, I guess, plans something like this is very like literal. But if He plans something for me or He has path for me, yeah. And I and I kind of defy that. You know how people say that God defies what you haven't planned? Yeah. Do you, do you believe that like? I don't know, I'm just trying to think out loud, like, so, I don't know if anything really constitutes like a challenge if you're, like, growing from. So you're saying, I mean, really you're saying nothing's a challenge, but then really everything's a challenge. And that's what the Gemara says. Everything is a challenge. I mean, every time you put your hand in your pocket, and you want to take out a nickel, right? Or you want to take out a quarter, take out a nickel or something, that's a test. Somehow that's, and use a very important word. 
The word for a difficulty is a tsar, a challenge. Mina mitzar, tsar is a challenge, yeah? Tsar. I'm going through difficulty, right? Tsar. It's difficult for me. That's the shoresh. The word tsar is related to another word, which is tsuro, which means to form. So it's a challenge, a difficulty, but it also means to form. A person is formed by these difficulties and challenges. Now, we don't like tests, by the way, I'll be very clear. You don't opt for tests. Actually, the worst thing a person should say, we're told, the Gemara says, never, the person says, oh, test me. No, no, you don't want to be tested. Right? That's not what you want. There is one person in Jewish history who said, test me, and failed because of it. Anyone know who that famous example is? Who has got to test him? David, King David, Dovod HaMelech. Dovod HaMelech said to God, you know what? I could be greater than him, test me. Not good. He was tested, that's also with Bathsheba, and he made a mistake and messed up on that test. So you don't want to be tested. You know, say, hey, lift that bar up, because you don't know where, you don't know where your next, God knows where your potential is, you don't know where your next potential is, you know, you could overbike and, I hear. No, you want to become great, but you don't want to be tested. Like, you're, you're gonna be, and the answer is, you're going to be tested anyway. Oh, right. No, I get it. No, for sure. I'm just like trying to think of it. Good. I like that. Very good. Yes. Um, this might be <laughs> If we have 10 tests, what's uh, the connection to the Hebrew phrase, Shabbat Ekel Tzadik? That, that is something else. Time? A great person, all great people will fail. Okay, seven times. Why seven? What seven represents often now. But as an idea, everyone fails and everyone messes their tests and, and, and fails. Everyone falls. No one does everything perfectly. Even a tzaddik, at least seven times will fall. At least seven times. Everyone's going to mail a failed test. Just because you're testing in your past, everyone fails tests. It's not about the tests, it's about the failure. Oh, you're saying even better. Right. Right. It's like when a child starts to walk, yeah? What do they do when the baby starts to walk? You ever seen that? They hold their hands, you ever see this? Right, I mean, no one here has any babies, I'm assuming at this point, but you've seen it, right? You've seen the baby, they hold the baby's hands, and what do they do? Why, that's so cruel. They let go, and then what's the baby do? No, they don't. They fall down. They always fall down. And you're watching, it's like, that is so mean. Why are they doing that? What a cruel, nasty parent. The baby's thinking, I was walking, what'd you let go for? And what does the parent say? What does the parent say? You were walking. I was walking. <laughs> you were walking. You think you were walking. I was doing the walking. So by baby falling down, now you're walking. Baby's like, one second. Now I'm falling, I'm walking, that's walking. Right. There's no perfection. There's no perfection. No one gets absolutely right. There is no perfection. No one becomes God. Everyone is constantly tested. Everyone fails and passes and then fails again, and it's constant. Right. That's actually, side point, one of the reasons the Jews didn't re reject Jesus. Many reasons the Jews rejected Jesus. And in my book, I listed a number of reasons. But one of the main reasons is because they said he's God. Eventually, not in his life. Many years later, when they said he's a god, he's perfect. We're like, no, no human can become god. Right. No human can become god. Okay, I know your mothers think you're god, so I understand that, but that's not the reality. That someone can be absolutely perfect, the level of god. No, even Moses didn't reach that level. Even Moses made mistakes. Right. Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest prophet that ever lived, was allowed into Israel. He messed up as well, didn't he? What did Moses do to prevent himself getting into Israel? How did he miss out on his mission? I remember, taking it back to Hebrew school, Jewish day school, the Ten Commandments moving, I don't know. He hit a rock. You remember that case, he hit the rock, once he hit the rock, remember that? And because of that, God said, come into Israel. By the way, is anyone with hitting rocks? Is there any law against hitting rocks? So why was Moses not allowed to get into Israel? Which, by the way, was his whole mission. The whole reason he took the Jewish people out of Egypt was to get into Israel. It was his whole, it's all he wanted to do to get into Israel. Why is that the question? It wasn't just to get a suntan in Tel Aviv. 
Right. He wanted to get in because he wanted to be involved in the mitzvah that are only in Israel. So what was the problem? So there's many opinions though, whole different people. Some people, one of the commentators says that he, Rambam, says he lost his temper. Lost his temper, he lost his mission. That's how getting bad angry is. But that's the next semester. Okay. So even apes, even the great Moshe Rabbein, the greatest prophet, even he messed up and didn't fulfill his entire mission in this world. Marvellous. Turn over the page. Let's do a little bit more. Okay. So for what is Abraham known for? What is he famous for? And interestingly, he's not really famous for his tests. They are mentioned, and they're in the Mishnah, and the tests are mentioned in the Torah. But he's not known as, I was Mr. Being Tested. What was he known as? What was his Midah, his character? What was his Midah? He was known as something that's very specific. What was it? He runs down? Yeah, we're good with this? What was Abraham really famous for? What was his main character trait? And this is really the opening scene when we meet him. It really, when we get to meet Abraham, we meet him doing one thing. What is that thing? What is his Mida? What is the Mida? The character trait that represents Abraham? Hospitable. Right. But what is the trait that that goes under? Chesed. <coughs> Chesed. Kindness. <coughs> that is what Abraham is famous for. And that's how we meet him. We don't meet Abraham sitting in a tent learning all day. I'm sure he did learn, and we said he wrote books, but it's not that Torah introduces him. He introduces him, to, the introduction is him being hospitable, doing chesed kindness. That's what it's all about. The fact that's how we meet Abraham probably means it's important stuff, right? I mean, that's how the whole Jewish thing got started. There must be something in his actions that makes it stand out. Let's have a look. Let's go back to Pirka Avot. <coughs> now you're gonna hear the expression Pirka Avot in other classes and in synagogues and yeshivas and at weddings. And I can know what's referring to. And you'll be like, wow, yeah, I just love a mission of Pirka Avot with Rabbi Hadjop in his class. It says in Pirka Avot, Al Shlosha Devarim, page six, those are following inside, please do. On three things, Ha'olam Omed, the world stands. The world stands on three things. You have to understand what that means the world stands on it. We'll get to that. But let's see what these three things are. Al HaTorah, on Torah. The Al HaAvoda. Now, the word Avoda literally means work. But it could mean something else as well. Vial gimilut chasadim. And on acts of chesed. Chasadim is plural, acts of kindness. So the world stands on three things. Here's the world. And we have three things. One, two, three. The first one is Torah, second is Avodah, and third is Chesed. Yeah? Torah, Avodah, and Chesed. Those are the three things. Before we try to figure out what these three things are, because one of them is not so clear. Why does it say three? What do the three represent? What does number three represent? Why three? What is, why does it say three? I'm sure there's plenty of good things. And when the world stands on these things, I want to say there's three great things we should all be doing. It doesn't say that. It says the world stands on these three things. What does that mean? The world stands on these three things. Imagine this is a three-legged chair. What happens if you remove one of the legs? It stops. It all falls. Now, happily, the number three is going to appear many times in Jewish thought, in Jewish life. As we go through our course, we'll find many of them. We see on Shabbat, there's three. And we'll see on Pesach, the number three occurs many times. We'll see the three types of Jew in the world. What are the three types of Jew? 
the Long Island ones, the New Jersey ones, and everybody else. I'm only kidding. <laughs> kind of. Right? We see this Cohen, Levi, Israel. So three represents a totality. A totality. That's what three represents. Take away one of these three, it's gone. The world stands on these three. If one of these three things go, no more world. Now that could be literal. That means eventually the world just would eventually stop. No more world. Bye-bye. Which means we must have these three or there'll be no world. Let's have a look at these three things. What's Torah? What's Torah? It's not a trick question. What's Torah? I, I feel like it is. <laughs> Bible. Bible well, okay, Bible just refers to that there's a book, right? Biblio, but what is it? What does it represent? What does the Torah give us? The five books of Moses. Right, five books of Moses. That's what the Torah is, that made up of five books of Moses. What's in the Torah? Our lives, that what? Our lives. It's not a history book. It's not a history book. There, there was a history in there. We have a historical, but it's not a history book. What's inside? What's the main reason we have Torah? It tells us what to do. It was the mitzvah. The mitzvah, the 630 mitzvah that we'll discuss, God willing, are found in the Torah. So the Torah is God's way of telling us what to do and what not to do, by the way. Okay, we're going to break down the 613, so don't worry. So Torah is God's mitzvah where we find the mitzvah, the actions we're meant to do. What's avoda? So avoda means work, but actually, says the Rambam and the other commentators, avoda refers to avoda shebelev, service. Of the heart. What's, what's the service of the heart? Prayer. Prayer. That's what the word avodah is a. And what's chesed? We did that one already. What's chesed? Acts of kindness. We have here the basic formula for all life. Torah is God telling us what to do. That's God talking to us. A vote of prayer is us talking to God, to a relationship, it's not a one-way dictatorship. There's only one way speaking. And kindness is us dealing with other people, each other. So those are the three relationships. God telling us what to do, that's the Torah. That's how the whole Jewish thing comes around. As we don't know what to do, that God communicates and gives us a guide, a blueprint, which is what the Torah is. Then we have a prayer, that's us relating to God. And acts of kindness, which just means everything that we do for other people, all the good stuff. Family, friends, relations, countries, chesed. If one of these three is gone, the whole thing stops. Does that mean literally eventually it blows up? I don't know. But that's what the world stands on. Okay? That's what the Mishnah is telling us. There's a lot more to the Mishnah, that's the basic understanding of the Mishnah. Okay? We are going to laser in on one of these three. Okay. We'll be talking about Torah later on in the course when we get to Moses, because that's when Torah is given. And we're going to talk about prayer at the end of the course. God willing, before we finish. But let's talk about Chesed, because that's how we meet Abraham. Let us have a look at a story. It's story time. Who likes story time? Uh, let's go to story time with Rabbi Hagia. And the story is in Beratius. And there's a very famous story of Abraham and three guests that came to visit him. Does anyone know what happened right before these three guests came to visit Abraham? Yes, Batya. Abraham was told to circumcise himself. Why? We'll discuss later on the course what that represents. But whatever it was, it was a painful operation that needed a lot of recovery time. Okay? Especially at his age, it's 100 years old. It says, look inside, gracious, the Yarelav Hashem Bele Mamre. God appeared to Abraham in Ele Mamre. He appeared to him. By the way, what was he doing? He was visiting the sick because Abraham was ill. There's a mitzvah to visit sick people. That's going to be important, by the way. Right? In a place called Ele Mam, Ele Mamre means the plains of Mamre. Mamre was a person, a very great person, by the way, who said, Abraham, come to my property, because Abraham was in a tent. He said, come, come and do this mitzvah on my property. Use me for this mitzvah. I want to be involved in this mitzvah. And by the way, he was mentioned the Torah for that. Good stuff. 
Okay, so Mamre was an individual, a very great person. Who Yosef Pesach Ohel Abraham is sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. What does that mean? All these words are important. Nothing superfluous in the Torah. The Torah mentions it. It's for a reason. What do we know? It's a hot day. How hot? Hot enough for the Torah to mention it. Where do people usually go when it's hot? Inside the house. Where is Abraham sitting? Outside. At the entrance to his tent. Weird, right? That just stand out immediately. Immediately be like, doesn't make sense. Are you with us? We're on page six. Second paragraph down. The Yisse enough, Abraham lifted his eyes. I don't know why to tell us that. Because he lifted his eyes. He's about to look at something. Another question. The yar and he saw the Behold, shlosha and Hashim did tzav love. There were three people standing there. The yar and he saw them. The yaratz and he ran to them. Lekratam to call them. Mipetacha oel to the entrance of his tent. But he shtachavuatz and he bowed down to them. Why is that important? He said, please, if I have found mercy in your eyes, don't pass your Eved, your servant. So Abraham is referring to himself as a servant over here. That's also interesting. Why is it important that it's a very, very hot day? Why is that important? Let's look at Rashi. So Rashi is going to live. What does Rashi do? So Rashi, Shlomo Yitzchaki, he lived in Troy in France about a thousand years ago. Actually, just over a thousand years ago. And he asks questions. So what does he do? He takes a little bit. He takes a few words. He's like, what's that doing over there? Pulls it out, copies and pastes it, and then writes an explanation of it. And he gives us what's called pshat. The basic understanding of the words or the ideas or the verse. That is what Rashi is going to do for us. He doesn't give us Kabbalah. He doesn't give us hints, usually. He always gives us Psha. What's Psha? What's happening over here? And he's got a question. Something is bothering Rashi. Something's always bothering Rashi. Over here, he's bothered by, it's a very hot day. Why does the Torah tell us a hot day? Why is that important? Says Rashi, I'll tell you why it was a hot day. God made it a really, really hot day. You know, there's like hot days, you go to Elat, right? You go to the Dead Sea, it's like 120 degrees, and you're like, oh my goodness. It's like walking in an oven. You know that? It was like that. I'll tell you why. Because God didn't want to bother Abraham. What's that mean? He didn't want to bother him with guests. He didn't want to bother Abraham with guests. Why? Why would he be bothered? Because he just had a circumcision. He's trying to heal himself. So God made it very hot. What does making it hot help? Because when it's hot, people are not out. And there were no people out because it was a very hot day. Everyone was indoors. But Abraham was very bothered. By what? By the fact that there were no guests. So what did he do? He walked out of his tent to go look for them. But there were none, because God made it very, very hot. So then what does God do? He's like, oh my goodness. Abraham is like going well beyond the call of duty over here. He's like, I'm gonna have to do it, I have to get him guests. But no one's out, so what does God do? He takes three angels, and he disguises them as guests to make Abraham feel better. Because the pain of having no guests is more painful than just having a circumcision sitting in the sun. I'll say that again. For Abraham, the pain of having no guests was more painful than the circumcision he just had. It hurt him more, not physically, but emotionally. 
And we all know that emotional pain can be worse than physical pain, right? I mean, that makes sense. So why did God do this? Lefisha Rao Mitztair. He saw that Abraham was very, very upset. Shalohi Yo Orchem Bam, there are no guests coming. Hey, the Hamalachim, he brought him angels, Bedemut Anashim, in the form of man. Men. Made them to passing traders. What does Abraham do? Abraham, when he sees them, he goes to get them. Look inside the verse we just looked at. What else is superfluous over here? Become Rashi, become a Rashi detective. What else stands out in these verses? Okay, it's very hot. Rashi answered that. We see it's very hot. What else does Abraham do over here? What else stands out in these verses? Look at even in the English. Just from the verses we just looked at. We are on number two, yeah. Those are the verses from the Torah. That's Bereshis. What else stands out over here? That's like, hmm, that, that didn't need to be mentioned, did it? There's a whole bunch of things, by the way. Ruth, look inside the verses. I get a story. Abraham wants to do chesed. It's very hot. Why? Rashi told me. God did him a favor, and they had to bring him angels to fix it up because he was in real pain. Okay. He brought guests. What else is extra of here? I, I could have got this idea that it's good to be nice to people. Why does I have to add all this extra information? What extra information is over here that on the surface I don't really need? Can anyone see it? What's extra in the narrative? Yeah. Well, one extra thing is that um, he began to read them from the entrance of his tent. Well, that's where he was. It is extra. We said because he was in so much pain, he put himself at the entrance of his tent to see what was going on. Yeah. You're right, that is extra. Didn't have to mention that, but that came to teach us something. What else? Ruth. He refers as himself as a servant. He refers himself as a servant. He was a very rich, important person. They were passing schleppers. Right? So that's going to be important. Yeah? He lifted his eyes. How else do you see someone? Why would they mention that? Right. What else? Yeah. He bowed to them. He bowed to them. Right. I have to say, why does he bow to them? Say, hey guys, come in here. What's this bowing thing all about? What else? Look inside, don't look at me. As my high school teacher used to say, the answer's not written on my face. Actually, it could be, by the way, but it's not over there. It's one big thing he's done over here that we're going to see come again and again and again. You said three represents a totality and there's three men that showed up. That's nice. I didn't think about that. Why three? Okay, that's good. I don't know the answer to that question, but that's a good question. I like that though. I never thought about that. Very good. Um, is it... It's a word. It's one word. Oh. But we're going to see it come again and again and again. It's going to be very, very important. This one word has within it. To greet. Oh, he had to greet them. He was being very respectful. He bowed down to greet them. But I'm saying like it's implied. Keep looking, keep looking, 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 looking. Look. He ran. He ran. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> he ran. What are you running for? Why is he running? How does he run in Hebrew? Rats. Rats. Ruts, he runs. What's he running for? Did he have to run? No. Were they going anywhere, these people? Was anyone else taking guests? We're going to see that no one was taking. Actually, some people, like in Sodom and Amorah, they were killing guests. He was the only one taking them in. So why is that important? By the way, that whole story, I believe, is there to tell us that one word, he ran. That is the most important part of that entire story. And by the way, he's going to carry on. Eventually, he's going to tell his wife, Maher, Tassi Ugot, 
He's going to make cakes, make food for them. He's going to run to get the cattle. That word, if you look at the extension of this narrative, you're going to see it comes up again and again and again and again and again. Why is it important? Just on a basic level. Just on a basic level, why is it important? It was like training for a marathon. Remember, Masa Avot, Siman Laban. If it's important to him, it's going to be important to us. There's some lesson over here, some information that is applicable to us as well. Yeah. Ooh, very nice. Do you know the Hebrew word for enthusiastically? Zrizut. He could have been like, you know what? All right, guy, yeah, come in here. Right, yeah, just let's go, let's go, come on. Yeah, I've got some food in here. He doesn't do that. He runs. He says, please, come inside. He bows, he shows great humility. That's what Bam represents. He's humble. He refers to them as his master. He says, I'm your servant. So we're learning a lot about his humility, which is going to be important. But the fact that he runs is a whole different lesson. Abraham is the ultimate runner. He acted enthusiastically. <coughs> he was very enthusiastic about it. He fed them. He fed them food, great food by the way. He promised them a little bit of water, a little bit of bread, but he gave them a full six course meal. Now, this, is how we, this is how we meet Abraham. We meet the first Jew doing kindness for others and doing it bezrezed, enthusiastically. He was passionate. He was excited, he wanted to get the job done. Now listen to this. It's gonna sound a little weird what I'm about to tell you. Does anyone know what time of year it was at this point? So it was Pesach. What did the rabbis tell us? It was Pesach time. Why is that important? By the way, how could it have been Pesach? Pesach is all about the Jewish people leaving Egypt. Were the Jewish people in Egypt at this point? No. There were no Jewish people yet. He's the first one. We'll leave that aside. When we talk about Jewish holidays, we'll figure out how that could be. By the way, how do the commentators know it was Pesach time, that time of year? Because he told his wife to make Ugot. Ugot in modern Hebrew are cakes, but in biblical Hebrew, the word Ugot means matzah. It's a code word for matzah, Ugot. Okay. I'll just write it down, but I'm not going to test you on this. Just, just interest you. Oh God. But this is next information is important. Let me just finish this off or look at questions. He gave them matzah. Why? Because that's what you mean on Pesach. The fact that it was Pesach and he gave them matzah is not a coincidence. This is very important. And this will answer our question. Why is the fact that it was Pesach and he gave them matzah relevant to the story. It's hinted at, and Rashi tells us, by the way, this was Pesach time. Why is that important? What is it about matzah that represents this story? That food is gonna represent this story. How? Has anyone seen matzah being made? How do you make matzah? What is matzah? What is it? What's it made of? Flour and water. You add flour to water, you make matzah. Right? You add flour to water. Then what's the difference between matzah and bread? Because bread is also flour and water. 
wasn't between matzah and lechem, bread. Yeah. Matzah and lechem. What's the difference between matzah and lechem? Bread rises. Bread rises. Very, very good. So what's the real difference between matzah and lechem? Time. That helps it right. What do you say? Time. Time. Exactly. Time. Lechem is left to rise. You leave it and it rises and rises and rises. Matzah does not rise. It's that flat cracker bread that tastes like the box it comes in. Right? That's what matzah is. Matzah is made quickly. How quickly? Very. From the moment water touches the flour, you've got 18 minutes to get into the oven. And you'll see on matzah boxes that are kosher matzah will say 18 minutes. Right? Has to be in 18 minutes. So one second. Let's think about this. This story is represented by a food because it was Pesach time. What is that food? Matzah. What does matzah represent? Time. What kind of time? quick time, going quickly. We are being taught a very important lesson. And that lesson is mitzvah ba'aleado al tachmitzana. If the chance for a mitzvah comes into your hand, you're able to do it, don't let the mitzvah, mitzvah become chametz. What's chametz? Bread. Act quickly. Like matzah is made quickly, so too we have to act quickly. Does that mean we have to run? Sometimes, but it means we have to act enthusiastically or with passion. What makes Abraham different? He was passionate about it. That is what Abraham was. Why was he the first one to start the Jewish people? He was passionate. Like, like matzah. You see matzah? Bam! Touch the water. Boom, boom, boom. He ran to do it. Mitzvah, get a chance to do a mitzvah. And actually the word matzah, or matzot, actually in the plural, matzot, is the same word for mitzvot. Spelled the same way. Matzot and mitzvot. Same word. Make your mitzvot into matzot. Make your mitzvot into matzot. Same word. Meaning, you do the enthusiastic and passionate, you run. So his running represents this enthusiasm, and that is what's coming out of the narrative, very importantly. We did a lot today. I feel good. We shall stop over there. We will, God willing, pick this up on Thursday and continue the story of Abraham, his circumcision, and then they give the Torah.